and welcome to episode 141 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. I'm John Denning in Los Angeles. John, anything going on that's exciting at all on this LSAT kind of uh, Tuesday? Oh, it's just been such a boring few days, Dave. <laughs> not, nothing at all to do. <laughs> and that probably tells everybody that we are going to talk about the October 2023 LSAT and recap the whole thing. And there is a lot to this test. Yeah. Not as not as many problems as, say, August, but a lot of content, more than the prior two tests. And so we got a lot to get through. But John, before we talk about any of that, <laughs> as interesting as it will be, yeah. what are you drinking? Hmm. You know, I always look for inspiration for these kinds of things. Last time we talked about all the issues people had scheduling Prometric, and that inspired me right to the bottom of a bottle of tequila. Uh, this one, it's, it's been, um, I, I was trying to look through the questions and be like, is there anything fun that I could drink from what these questions are? And my two options that I saw were I could drink wine or I could drink absinthe. Having had proper absinthe before, I, I can tell you that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So, I went with a bottle of Silver Oak Cab, the Alexander Valley, the cheaper version. Interesting choice. Yeah, so I've got some wine here. Um, the way you say that makes me think you might not be a fan, even though you and I have visited their facility a couple of times there in Napa. The Napa one, yeah. Silver Oak was, I don't know if it still is, was actually the highest selling in terms of volume red wine in the United States restaurants for years. Well, restaurants, okay. I was going to say, it's got to be two buck chuck or something out of Trader Joe's. No, but like for the restaurant trade, like sense. the food bev, it was uh, big. And I used to really like it. And then I discovered over time that I didn't like American oak and they use 100% American oak. And let's move on from that topic now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That could be the whole podcast if we're not careful. Yeah. We're not going to get into like the use of uh, French versus American oak. But I'm not drinking wine because I wasn't in the mood for it. In fact, I was at a party late Sunday, mm. interestingly. Uh, it's always great to do that in the middle of the LSAT. And one of my friends was making a Mai Tai, and he had made a really good version of it. And at the end, I was like, you know what? Put a float of Amaretto on this. Because I've had that before. It's kind of like classic Mai Tais. Mm -hmm. And it was so good that today I'm having an Amaretto sour. Nice. Another inspired choice. Well done. Mm -hmm. So what's the song, John? I know you're a big fan. Uh, you say that a little facetiously, but truth is, I kind of am. Uh, she's She's been in the news a lot lately for a number of different reasons. She had a big tour, obviously. I read the other day that she's going to make somewhere in the neighborhood of about $4 billion from this tour. And if people don't know who I'm talking about yet, clearly it's Taylor Swift. Uh, and her Beyonce's up there too, though. Her era's tour. Yeah, Beyonce's no slouch. Yeah. But I, I think Taylor may take this round. And obviously, there's been a lot of NFL talk around Taylor as well. So she made Travis Kelsey famous. I feel like he, his two Super Bowl wins helped. <laughs> but she hasn't heard. She made him, yeah, famous in some new circles, I think. Yeah, he was uh, pretty well known beforehand. There's a big meme going around about people, you know, wives typically saying to their husbands, oh, no one knew who Travis Kelsey was. And then the husband's getting very upset about it. I'm like, yeah, I knew who Travis Kelsey was. I'm follow the NFL pretty closely, but I, that doesn't make me too unhappy. I think it's hilarious. She's much more famous than he is. Oh, God. Yeah, she's much more famous than arguably anyone is right now. And the song we picked, and you suggested the song, but I double down on it is a song called ready for it which i think does yeah. a pretty good job to encapsulate how people should uh the posture people should take for this episode today get ready for it because there's an awful lot of content to cover yeah and it's actually one of my favorite songs that she does i think it's one of her cooler ones great lyrics i love the beat on it and on that note let's go for it john let's start with the lsat world let's recap what we've got going on with november and january here sure um you said that as, as a setup for me, so I'll do it. So, <laughs> obviously, the next test that we have coming up in three weeks, four weeks or so, is the November 2023 LSAT. The registration for that closed September 28th, so we're well past when you can sign up for it. That test, interestingly enough, starts on a Wednesday, which I believe is a first for the LSAT. I can't think of any test starting that early in the week. Never. It's going to run for four days just like October did, but Wednesday, in this case, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it's going to run the 8th through the 11th. Uh, scores for that will release right after Thanksgiving on the 29th of November. And then the calendar flips and we get into 2024. 
and right away we're hit with another test in January. That one's going to be on Friday and Saturday, the 12th and 13th of January, and there is still a good bit of time to register for that one. Registration deadline for that is the end of November, November 30th. So even if you take that November test, you will get your scores back one day before uh, the deadline closes to register for January. Good news, ultimately, for people. Yeah. I can't say that I'm looking forward to that November test because four days of test content was rough. Uh, grueling might be the, the better word. January is only two days, and I hope it stays that way. I would like to see them get back to the two-day versions of this. Yeah, me too. Obviously, they're, they're doing four days because of all the problems with Prometric, and we had some problems, which we'll cover shortly. Not as not as many as August, though. Yeah, it but reminds me taking- a little bit of what people say with the difference in like two kids versus three or four, that these things don't escalate arith- arithmetically, they escalate geometrically. Two days of this test is a lot to manage. Four days is not just twice as much. It's 20 times as much. Okay. Uh, speaking as someone who has a child, let me tell you what the actual truth is. Okay. You, you give me real math. I'm it just is exponential. Math. Yeah. All right. That's what geometric so, means. But. Well, one kid is one, two is four. So it is double. Fair enough. And then three is nine. That's <laughs> okay. what the, that's what the workload ends up being. We're just doing squares. So yeah, four then would be sixteen. It's it's substantially more work with four days than two, um, and that's what we just discovered in October, taking months off my life. Now, if you are studying for November or January, and obviously a lot of people are. We do a bunch of free seminars. Uh, I've got a bunch that are coming up. First off, the crystal ball that we did for both October and November is still active on our website. You can go to powerscore.com forward slash LSAT, and there is a form there that you can sign up for that. The predictions that we made, uh, which we will talk about in relation to October, still hold for November. There's a number of other webinars coming up, including a parallel reasoning, uh, logical reasoning sem- uh, seminar on the 24th of October. There's some RC on the 8th of November. There's an LSAT 101 webinar early in December. But the question that I think a lot of people are interested in as it relates to crystal balls and webinars is, we did that mini ball back between the April and June LSATs. Are we going to do a mini ball for the November LSAT? I think a pretty resounding no at this point. Um, And there are a number of reasons for that. One is just the timing of it. These back-to-back test months make for very little opportunities, just a teeny little window where we could actually do this and have it be as effective uh, as we'd like. I really don't want to have to crank out a mini ball three or four days before someone's going to sit for November. I feel like that'd be almost unfair. Uh, And secondly, as we'll talk through, a lot of the predictions that we made for October and November just happened in October. But that Overall, I think the crystal ball that we did for both of these tests is going to still be highly applicable. To me, I'd rather people go to that as the source, and we'll amend certain aspects of it as we go through this episode. That's exactly right. It's really tough. We, You and I looked at our schedules that are coming up, and it would be very difficult for us to do this any more than a few days in advance of the start of this test. And I think it's actually more distracting. Yeah. And even though some of the content that we talked about was used, there's enough still there that you can adjust it effectively mm-hmm. and, and and move forward. So with that uh, kind of handled, <laughs> it's a little bit less work for us. It's also these back-to-back LSATs, there's just not enough time. Yeah, it's it comes tight. up so fast. There's still a retake to occur for this exam. I I wish we could make it happen, but I just don't see it actually happening. Let's talk about what did happen. though. Let's get into the October 2023 test. Let's first talk about the size of this exam Mm -hmm. and how things worked out over the four days. And I'm just going to talk about each day a little bit in terms of the size of the test takers, because originally this was a Friday, Saturday test. And then prior to opening up the test scheduling, they added Sunday and Monday. So it's kind of interesting to see where the volume shows up. On Friday, you had about 6,300 people complete the test. On Saturday, 6,900 or so completed it. And then on Sunday, it dropped down to Mm 3,900. And then finally, uh, on Monday, it was 4,200. You add in a couple hundred retakers you're probably looking at around 21,500 test takers. So a significant size, but you can see Friday and Saturday have the real volume there. And we saw more delays on those two days with proctors coming in. Mm -hmm. Nothing that was catastrophic, but sometimes uh, individuals were affected where it's like, you're waiting longer than you really want to wait. We didn't see any systemic issues. So I think that's really kind of an important thing as well. 
But that didn't mean that on Friday and Saturday in particular, there weren't delays where people had to sit and wait for the proctor to show up. Yeah. And that's proctoring is something we'll come back to in a moment because yeah, we saw a few issues there. Yeah. It's interesting. L- LSAC on their site still has, they haven't updated the actual test takers yet. I'm sure they will in the next couple of days, but they do still have the registration numbers here for, uh, for October, which are 23,693 as of this minute on this recording. So about what we would expect, a 10% or so attrition from registered to actual test takers, 21,500. So yeah, pretty predictable there, but a big test, certainly much larger than anything we've seen in a while. Yeah, and you go back a few weeks, it was even higher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been slow dropping rate was, off. Uh, It's been dropping down a lot. If I recall correctly, it was like close to 28,000 when they reached their peak and it dropped way off. But that's not abnormal, especially because I think the way the timing of this worked, uh, a lot of people registered before they got their scores of the prior test and so forth. So either way, we know there was about 21,500. There will be retakers next week. I think it's Tuesday that they retake it. Too, yeah. uh, if you had problems that are significant, notice that one of the things that I've seen is if you had minor issues, they are not granting retakes. Uh, and also, they don't force you to take a retake. You have to request it. You have to complain about it. But, you know, a proctor saying something to you or three proctors saying something to you in a section, that's not right now enough to generate a retake from what I've been seeing from them. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that policy. I think they should be very lenient with retakes because any disruption is a problem. Uh, But that's just something that we happen to disagree on. Regardless, though, when you take the test, everyone will get their score back on Wednesday, November 29th or the 29th. Um, And so ultimately what we'll be looking at, and maybe it's actually October 29th, sorry. Uh, It is the 29th though, that the Wednesday comes out at 9 a.m. That's whether or not you took the regular test or the retake test. And that's as long as you have an LSAT writing on file and there were no further issues. Yeah. I think we might have a bit of date confusion here that the score release for this is actually November 1st. So I must have had the the wrong note there. <laughs> it's all right. I'm um, tired. But yeah, no, it's it's fine. I think anybody listening to this realizes that's what the Wednesday is going to be. Um, it'd be very rare someone who takes this test and isn't looking to the calendar as to when their scores are coming back. So forgive us the slight confusion, but I doubt there was much on the receiving end. Wednesday, 11-1, you will get your scores back, whether you're a makeup tester or any of the past four days. Uh, 9 a.m., so bright and early, you can start checking your account and you'll see your results. Well... That was an issue. So speaking of issues, <laughs> you know, let's take a look at what happened. Were there systemic issues with this test? No. Yeah. There wasn't a major system breakdown like we saw uh, specifically in August. Uh, there were problems that we know that we had with scheduling beforehand. Uh, there were a lack of in-person test taking slots, which I find problematic because I think the demand for those in-person slots has grown significantly. I think it will continue to grow because the problems that we're seeing are far more on the remote side uh, than the in-person side. I saw some decent praise for the ProMetric in-person staffs at various centers, people saying they were professional, they handled issues. It's not perfect, though, because there's sometimes somebody next to you talking the whole test or tapping their foot loudly or there's noise. But it is something that uh, the in-person experience generally seems to be superior to the remote experience. And there's success on both sides. There's also failure on both sides. The thing that we saw more of this time was not anything that was catastrophic. It was just a lot of proctor issues. Yeah. Seeing a lot of like rude proctors, mm-hmm. uh, they pass you through different proctors sometimes. Uh, sometimes you get the same proctor the whole time. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's five. And they tend to come in and it's almost like they want to show you their badge. I need to see your room now. Yeah. I need you to do a scan. And I'm like, officer, calm down. You know, get your hand off your face. And I know what I would be if I was a remote test taker. I would be a guy talking back. Yeah. Like, no, shut up, report me. This isn't a violation. Listen here, but you mall cop. Like, what are yeah, you, mall cop. You relax. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what these people are. They think they're trained professionals, but they're mall cops. Mm-hmm. Um, and it bothers me because they have the weapons to cause mass destruction as they go through working with various test takers, interrupting them. You can sometimes hear them talking on their microphones. Does it add up to something that's devastating? No, but it's something that really they need to clean up. And I know they're trying. They do send them messages, but it's, 
you know, LSACs in Pennsylvania. They're not sitting there typically with somebody like on the floor of of all these proctors. And a lot of times they're not in one place, uh, kind of like policing them. So it's mm-hmm. been a little bit of an issue. What other issues did we see there? It was, yeah, I think the search function is still um, pretty buggy. It still feels very beta. And if you're not sure what I mean by search function, LSAC used to allow, uh, as part of this, where you could do a control or command F and search for words specifically, and it would find them on your screen. This was not a bug, it was a feature. People loved it, especially for reading comprehension. And what LSAC did is they tried to essentially duplicate that or replace it really in the interface itself. So there's now a little search bar at the top. You can type a word and hit search, and it's meant to go find every instance of that. But by almost all reports, it's laggy, it's buggy, it's kind of ineffective. Uh, so I know there were frustrations with that as well, especially when the thing it replaced worked great. Yeah, I saw a lot of this. I actually flagged this to LSAC. I was like, you really need to take a look at this because they don't think it's working the way you want it to work. You know, they want it to work. Sure. There's not some kind of like malicious intent here. They would prefer that the whole thing be seamless and there's zero problems because that would mean a lot less work for them. Uh, this search function, though, is too oftentimes causing frustration. I'm seeing just a rising set of complaints as people have become very aware of it. I still see a few too many test disconnections as well. I'd like Mm -hmm. to see those go away. Although it's hard to read those because somebody who got their test disconnected is very likely to go say something about it publicly, whereas the people who didn't have an issue are less likely to say something. So we know that there's a little bit of a a bias in the numbers there, but still one is too many. Uh, It's probably unavoidable, though, with just connectivity issues in general across the world. Yeah. I will say, if I had to to sum this up as the third prometric test here, this is what seemed to be the best of the bunch. I think that's safe to say. Again, scheduling issues notwithstanding, we've covered that in depth. I think the test experience, both remote and especially in person, um, was, was pretty good this time relative to the absolute disaster in August and a, a number of the issues that we saw even in September. I don't want to paint a rosy picture and say it's perfect, but it is getting better. Yeah, when you start really at the lowest possible <laughs> Where, point, yeah, it's no going way to, go to get but better. Up. I mean, there was no way but up. So I'm not giving them a free pass, but I am. I'm, I know that it's frustrated them, and um, understandably so. They wanted it to be better, and part of this is the new vendor. It's Prometric. We've talked about that before. I'm not going to elaborate on it. Uh, we've done whole podcast episodes on the switch and the problems caused by going from Proctor U to Prometric. Instead, let's get into the conversation about the content of the test. Usually at this point, I make a long, (laughs) uh, painful for me set of reminders and disclaimers. And I'm only going to, I'm going to shorten this significantly today, John. All right. A, because I'm not in the mood. (laughs) And uh, secondly, because I've said it on pretty much every episode that we do a test recap. So like 20 times or something. And if anybody wants to listen to it entirely, they can go back. But I will highlight just a few things super fast. And the first thing is always the last thing. Please don't summarize this online. It's a real simple request. Every single test I see people do it. If I see it happening and it's wrong, I usually say something. I'm like, come on, there's nuance to this. Let people hear what we have to say directly. This is a test that has some points of nuance to it. We'd rather not just have it be like, oh, it's zero or one, but you know, hear it. Also, we'll say that the section order doesn't matter. It never matters. Uh, it hasn't mattered in a long, long time. So the other thing is, is if we don't talk about content that you had on your test, it's because we didn't hear from you yeah. or we didn't hear from other people who had your content. There was a lot of content. It was extremely challenging to sift through. We think we got it all. Uh, in the cases where we're uncertain, we'll actually mention that. Uh, at this point, LSCC allows you to talk about generalities and content and so forth, but everybody's so sick of the test at this point, they just move on from it. So the only other thing I will say is that, remember, every LSAT's difficult. And uh, when we say something's easier, we don't mean it's easy. We just mean it's not on the hardest level of difficulty, but it is still hard. And then last but not least, if they use sections before that were real, we assume that they are real. And that factors into our predictions on experimentals, real sections, and so forth. To our knowledge, we've never been wrong yet. Uh, and I'd like to keep that track record mm-hmm. 100%. But uh, that is just something to be aware of. They can change their policy at any point, something that we'll talk about a little bit more. But as you go through this, again, my big ask is please don't summarize this online. 
it misses the nuance. It's a free podcast. Just send people to the, the <laughs> podcast itself. All right, John. Let Let me, before we get into it, let me make one more reiterative note for people, because I heard a lot of people in a regretful tone posting online saying like, I forgot to write things down. So this is advice we've given before. It's advice that a lot of people took to heart and were grateful to have done so, but some people missed it. So I'll say it again. After your test is over, jot down some quick thoughts on each section, make notes of topics, make notes of difficulty, questions you had to skip or guess on. Um, this helps you do a better self-assessment. And frankly, it helps us when we are able to talk about things, talk about them with greater accuracy and greater insight. So again, it, it benefits everyone if you take some notes after the test. I know that's not what you want to hear. If I'm a test taker and I've just gone through four sections, this the last thing I want to do is make more notes. It is worth it. Do it. You'll be glad you did. It's the way you can figure out after the test and you start hearing recaps like this, whether or not the section that you thought was real was real or whether it was, you know, experimental mm -hmm. and how that might affect your perception. You and I both heard a lot of people say, I hope that LR is real yeah. or I hope that one's experimental or I hope that RC is not scored. This is what allows you to make that determination. In games and reading comprehension, it's usually easier to remember. In LR, this is absolutely a crucial thing to do for your own sanity and tracking it a little bit later. All right, this was an international administration. So we have not just domestic test takers in the US and Canada, but also international test takers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll kick it off with the international test. And John, you know, a question about the accuracy of the crystal ball here. Where where did it all play out? Yeah, we'll talk about this in both instances, the, the people overseas, and then back to the domestic, which is going to be the bulk of this. Um, the international people got two different experiences here. Some of them, which we'll cover in the domestic, saw the same stuff that people stateside did. So we will come to that. If you hear this international discussion we're about to have, and it doesn't match your topics, sit tight. You probably just had a domestic test overseas. Um, which is normal. They do that a lot. The test that was uniquely international, though, and only people overseas saw, ended up being the third usage of the content. Uh, and just to spoil it a little bit, we saw this originally back in November of 2020. We saw it get used again in September of last year, September 2022. And now they've used it for a third time. And as we have said in every crystal ball, we are trying to predict first reuses. Something that's happened once and we expect to happen again when it gets to third, fourth, fifth reuses, and this was a third reuse, all bets are off. It's impossible for us to predict that because it opens up essentially the entire library that LSAC has. Uh, so what I will say is this isn't something we even tried to predict. These tests uh, as a third usage weren't something that was even on our radar because it really can't be. And Dave, you may want to elaborate on that or feel like I haven't explained it um, oh, no. clearly enough. I, I I do want to elaborate, but not because I feel like you didn't explain it clearly well, enough. That's sweet of you. I think if you go back to when we started doing this, which if my memory serves, was it July 2019 or 2020? I, my memory clearly doesn't serve. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't think it would have been July 2019. That was the transitional LSAT. It was July 2020 when they added the test, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Okay. May 2020 might have been the first one. I know that was the first flex. Yeah, there was the first flex, but then they added another test because they'd had so many problems with the pandemic. And um, maybe it was the transition. I got. I have to go back and look at the notes, regardless of that particular point. What happened at that juncture was, I remember quite clearly you and I sitting at my house mm -hmm. having this conversation in my office and talking about the LSAT that they were going to add and it dawning on us that they had a problem. They didn't have enough LSATs made to fill in the extra LSATs that they were adding. And we went back through the records that we had and we said, there's, there's gotta be some tests that just haven't appeared recently. And one candidate really came up by far as the most likely one. And then we started telling people, we think they're gonna reuse this and they did. Mm -hmm. And that kind of kicked off this idea of the crystal ball. And it, it was because we knew that LSAC had a problem. They didn't have enough tests to match the massive test usage that the pandemic forced upon them and the additional test kind of like uh, administrations that they added in the run-up to 2020 that was unrelated to the pandemic at all. And that's what allowed us to do this. And yeah. as we've gone through this, we've watched them use various tests, as you said, like first use, second use. When they start using tests three, four, or five times, it becomes almost literally like a crapshoot. 
you're guessing, you're rolling the dice. And so I've said this for a long time, and you've certainly echoed it, is the idea that we're living in a golden age that will end. The end is coming soon. Yeah. So those of you who have been testing this year, and we've been very fortunate to get a lot of the, you know, our predictions have shown up. I don't know what the next year is going to actually hold as far as this. Once we see that we can't be effective, if that day comes, we will stop. Yeah, this is the first test experience where I really felt like the the end of this is kind of imminent. Uh, I can I can hear the bell tolling. So we'll see. Which, I mean, I, I don't want it to end because again, it's it's wonderful to be able to do this. But the more they start using things for the third or fourth time. And again, this international that we're about to talk about is the third usage minimum. The, I mean, it doesn't just become impossible for us to do this. I think, frankly, it would be a, a shame for us to do this. It would be misleading on some level to think that we had the accuracy that we've had when the test makers are actively avoiding it. Yeah. We've gone through a very, very special period of time where they didn't have too many options and that made them predictable. Yeah. And all of this is on them. This is their fault. Uh, they didn't have enough tests. They amped up the number of test administrations. Then the pandemic accelerated that. Uh, but this won't last forever, uh, which is sad to me. But at the same <laughs> time, we were fortunate because, again, every test I go in and I'm like, the odds of us getting anything right feel insurmountable to me. It should not be possible. We shouldn't be able to tell you that zebra mussels is going to be on your test or at least has a chance of being on your test and then have some people get zebra mussels on their test. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's outrageous in the in the annals of test preparation. Uh, it's probably, I, I've said this before, I think one of the truly greatest ex kind of achievements within test preparation. So when it ends, it'll suck because it'll be like, well, the championship run is over. Yeah, that's exactly right. I remember sitting with you when you had this insight, and again, credit to you. It's the closest I've ever seen to like a, a cartoon light bulb appearing above somebody's head in real life. This epiphany that you had of like, wait a minute, what are they going to, they're going to have to get desperate. What are they going to do to fill all these new test dates? And immediately it was clear to us what they had to do. And honestly, we've milked it for three years. It's been an incredible run, um, but the end is coming. Yeah, but we'll see what happens in November. That will start dictating whether or not uh, there are future crystal balls. But this is this is notice. Uh, the golden era, we can tell, <laughs> is coming to a close. So, John, on that note... Let's talk about this international primary usage that they had. You want to run through it? Yeah. And again, just to reiterate, because we had a little sidebar there for a minute, what we're about to talk about was stuff that was unique to internationals, but not every international test taker got this content. Some got the things we'll talk about under the domestic section here that's coming right after this. So again, if none of this matches and you're overseas, sit tight. We'll get to you. For now, though, here's what we saw that was unique to the overseas test takers. Um, I'll start with Logic Games. Again, the sourcing of this goes back to November 2020, repeated again in September of 22, and now again in October of 23. 23 questions in this section. These games were real. Uh, the first one was about an art gallery with paintings and sculptures, different rooms, uh, each that had a couple paintings and I think one sculpture. There was a game about zoo vet visits, I think a veterinarian going to different, see different animals or something. The third game, six different cuisines, Greek, Hungarian, Jamaican, uh, I think Korean, at a restaurant over five days of a week. And then finally, it ended with a game about public and municipal, municipal branches, like parks, roads, sewers, all reporting to finance and oversight committees, uh, a game that got a lot of attention. I think probably the toughest in that set. So those were the real games. We didn't see any experimental games overseas or foreshadowing domestically. So that's what people had for games. Reading comp, ditto, just a single section that we saw in use. So all four of these passages were real. Also from those same source tests, 27 questions here. The first passage was about the removal of Indian tribes from Canadian national parks. Second passage was about academic science journals, uh, about social media and vaccines in particular. A passage I'd like to read, frankly, it feels kind of topical and probably depressing. Mm. That was the comparative passage for that set. Um, my favorite passage of the bunch had to be passage three, which is about Goya's black paintings uh, and the difficulty that art historians had in dating them. This was tough, but I like the subject matter, and I've seen a lot of Goya's work in Madrid, so uh, I, would, I think I would enjoy that passage. Uh -huh. And one I probably wouldn't enjoy is the fourth one, about punishment in law uh, and the utilitarian purposes of punishment versus the idea of just desserts. Not too bad a passage, but again, a lot of people struggle with it just after that Goya passage running out of time. 
So those were the four real reading comp passages that people overseas had. And then finally, we get into logical reasoning, and there were two scored sections of logical reasoning, both, again, sourced from those same original pairs of tests, November 2020, September 22. Here were the two sections, some topics from each. So one of the real logical reasoning sections had questions on uh, dinosaurs butting heads, a question on illegal music downloads, uh, a question on AI, artificial intelligence, and early artificial intelligence machines being unable to distinguish tasks if they weren't designed for them. I think it referred specifically to things like medical diagnoses. Note too, this is not the last time we're going to talk about artificial intelligence today. There's another question. Same, t- uh-huh. yeah, different section though, because that one was about Shakespeare. That's exactly right. Yeah. So again, you can see where confusion would come in. More questions in this section. Uh, monkeys teaching other monkeys, I think it was rhesus monkeys, how to behave, how not to be aggressive when they get angry and fight. A question about crystals and rubies and the dating of tectonic plates formation. And then a question I'd love to see about a spirit photographer. Spirit in this case, not the fun kind, which is drinks, um, but the spooky kind, which is ghosts. Yeah. So that was all real. All of those real, if you can match, and we'll say this again, I'm sure at some point, if you can match even one of those questions to one of your sections, that section counted. There was another scored section, again, from those same source tests. Here were some questions from it. Uh, It was a question on coffee houses and breweries, question on Napoleon and his death and whether it was the result of arsenic poisoning. Question about a blue porcelain teapot, question about trading in the UK in the 7th and 8th centuries. Uh, There was one in there about West Coast sales reps not meeting their quotas. And then a question about students watching less TV and studying more. Again, match one or two of those and you know that section was real for you. There was an experiment. Yeah, there was an experimental section. And this to me is, I think, distinctive enough that we can get away with mentioning it. Typically, we don't do experimental LR. But to uh, maybe give a little peace of mind to our friends overseas, these questions were in the experimental logical reasoning section. So these did not count. You can ignore them as you make an assessment. Questions about tiger moths making a click, click sound. That was a question in there a lot of people talked about, about Taiwanese jade. Uh, And this, again, I kind of referenced in my drink choice. That was a question about absinthe being outlawed in the 19th century for the hallucinatory effects, presumably. (laughs) <laughs> presumably presumably not for van gogh <laughs> no no definitely not speaking of van gogh though, i think the only place i've had real absinthe was with you in amsterdam and it is no joke it's strong no, i, I just remember it was like drinking acid oh yeah i remember that little we were we were with a bunch of people in a little bar in Amsterdam, and that was, I just remember thinking, I can't drink a whole lot of this, which is a shame because I really would like to experience the effects, but it's going to be like a bullet <laughs> just shooting right through me. I, I wasn't too, I wasn't happy with the taste of it, even though they burned sugar over it and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, it's a whole process for anyone who's never seen the actual rigmarole of it. It's, uh, it's a whole setup for it. I loved it. I, they opened the bottle and I was like, throw away the top. We're going to be here a, a while. <laughs> We were up late all those nights. Yes, we were. Some Amsterdam all sunrises. Right. Uh, yes, bridges over the canals. I remember it well. I remember walking into a bar in, uh, in uh, which square was it? Dom. The lights blind, I think, maybe at like 4.30 in the morning. So about, ha- about halfway through our night. <laughs> It was enjoyable, that was for sure. So let's talk about the scoring matrix for this. And for those of you who have not been through this before, uh, let's talk about how it works. First off, what we're trying to do is figure out the number of questions you can miss to get a 170. The estimate starts for all these tests as you could miss on average seven. And then we talk about each section and each section will either have no effect on the scale in this case, or it will loosen it by one. So we move from seven to eight. So what we'll do here for the international is pretty easy. We'll just identify each section, tell you the impact in our estimation on the scale. And as always, we're on the conservative side, if anything. That logic games, the art galleries, zoo visits, restaurant cuisines, and the finance oversight committees, not going to change the scale. So you'd still be missing seven questions to get a 170. The RC will move the scale. Uh, We've had this in prior times when we talked about this test. That's the tribes and Canadian parks, science journals, the Goya passage, which would also interest me, and then punishment and law. 
uh, the, maybe the carceral state, so to speak. That would move it from seven to eight. And then both the LR are not going to move this section. So that doesn't matter whether you have the dinos and the monkeys and the rubies and the spirit photographer or the coffee houses, Napoleon being poisoned, the blue teapot and so forth. Neither one of those make a difference. So every one of the international test takers who had this form or one of these two forms, you are at missing eight questions to get a 170. So hopefully that is of some help. Uh, and John, I would say we're probably pretty loose with it uh, during that conversation. So we'll tighten it up for the domestic discussion here. Fair enough. Well, interestingly enough, that's actually the easiest one for us to have done because everybody who got that test got us to minus eight. Um, things yeah. are about to get a lot more complicated. Uh, yes, they are about to get a lot more complicated. So let's move on to the U.S. Canadian domestic versions of the October 2023 LSAT. And the thing we're going to find is that there were potentially, as far as we can tell, about 60 different combinations. However, there weren't 60 different combinations. Some of these test sections were paired with each other in ways that reduced the number of outcomes. But for example, as we'll see, uh, there was, you know, like four logic games, probably five logic games, five, four reading comprehensions that were real. It's just a lot of content to keep track of, much of which was used before. And so it was a reappearance that we're familiar with, some of which was new. Let's talk first about the crystal ball, because I found it very interesting. The last couple of tests, you go back to August and September, on the very first day, some of the topics that we had specifically predicted for RC showed up. And you saw a lot of posts on various uh, forums like, wow, you guys nailed it. That didn't happen in the first morning of this test for RC. And it was interesting for me to see the completely different reaction. Uh, people saying, no, you guys missed it. And I'm like, first off, it's the first morning of a four-day test. There's a lot to go. And also, this is just RC. It has nothing to do with the rest of it. <laughs> What's your comments about the uh, crystal ball predictions as it related to some of these domestic forms? Yeah. First, I mean, you've already touched on it. When they're going to run this thing over four days, and I mean, not even we could see the number of sections they were going to ultimately use as scored. I mean, RC alone, there were four. Um, four that we caught, hopefully not a fifth. Games, there were, I think, five. LR, there were at least three. With that much variability over four days, trying to make an assessment of our predictions on day one or even day two is, I mean, premature doesn't even do it justice. It's hasty to the point of uh, silliness. So what I was telling people through those first few days is first, I'm sorry that the predictions didn't match what you had, but remember this is, uh, we're in this for the long haul. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So eventually, what we started yeah. to see in later days is that our predictions actually were exactly right. They just made people wait until late Saturday, Sunday, and sometimes even Monday to see them. What I will say, though, about that Friday test that was in use, Friday test sections that were in use early, is they did pull from one of the tests that we had recommended people go review, the podcast that you could go review, which was April 2022. For anyone with a reasonably decent memory, we just talked about April 22 as a source for the international test as well. So they really milked these exams, November 20, April 22, for both international and now domestic. But given that this was a third reusage, it was hard to anticipate this exact content, even though we predicted the right test, if that makes sense. That April 22 test had multiple games, multiple reading comps. Um, we were seeing some of them get reused again. So that's what we hope people were able to take away from it. So even though we didn't predict these topics, we did predict this test. The topics came later in the week. A weekend. Yeah, I think um, maybe the best way to put this is we did not anticipate that they would use as many tests as they did. I don't think there was a need for it. I think they're so worried about security. Uh, and, and this is kind of like a pet peeve of mine that is slowly but surely growing is all the proctoring stuff, all the test security issue. It's definitely a situation where I think they've gone well past normalcy. Don't put your you know, your face on your hand. Come on. Yeah. I mean, what kind of world are we living in? It's going to the airport and taking your shoes off because one person years ago tried to pull something with their shoes. And I'm like, am I really hiding my mouth behind my hand and trying to cheat? No one's doing that. It would be ridiculous. There's a microphone right there. And so I really feel like we're going to have to start impressing upon LSAC that the fact that you guys are turning it into a state of such... um 
observation and control that you're not giving people the opportunity to have a normal test experience. You're compromising it repeatedly with your policies. And part of that kind of fear that they have, and I understand the fear, you know, one of these tests gets out, it's a million dollars burned. Yeah. Uh, but but bad actors are out there. We, we already know that. If they were going to come out, it would. Um, and so I think what they have to look at is when they do this, they're like, we're going to use a lot of different tests so nobody can keep track of anything. And that just lends to more confusion, uh, you know, ultimately. But I don't think we anticipated how paranoid they were going to be about this. So even though we had some of those tests on the list of most likely usages, we didn't dig deep into them from a topical standpoint, at least for RC. Yeah. So it really is. You're right. I mean, it's, it's, don't get me started on the security theater of TSA in the airport, but this is starting to feel like LSAT North Korea or something where it's like, what are you really worried about here, guys? What are you so afraid of? Nobody's doing anything to, to violate your security or undermine this. Um, mm. And we thought for a while they were on the right track with it. We saw several test dates earlier this year where they just use a couple of sections of games, two pass, two reading comp passage sets. And it was plenty. It was plenty. So the fact that they've used, say, five logic game sets here is, I mean, it's the definition of overkill. My suspicion is they're likely doing this because they've got a lot of games content to burn before they swap the section next year. That's all I can figure, because if they're just doing this purely for security, it's ridiculous. That's exactly the case. So let's, I'm going to go through the games part, John, and then I'll let you uh, yeah. hit the RC. You got the bulk, so uh, go for it. There's a bunch here, and there's some, there's some comments that I want to make about this. First off, you know, there's four sections that we know for sure that they use in games. The fifth one, when we get to it, we suspect that they've used it, but it came in from what we could tell late on Monday, and we didn't get much information on it. So uh, we'll have to actually see how this plays out. But John just kind of touched on the idea that like, they're using a lot of logic games. Uh, it almost feels like they're cleaning it out now. And I think we can probably expect a wider degree of difficulty uh, over the next several tests. You might get games that are completely normal. You saw a lot of people saying, oh, those games were standard. And then you had some people saying, this section was brutally difficult. Uh, I found it really hard. And that is something that I think we're going to expect. For, we've been through a long period of time here where things were relatively normal in terms of logic games difficulty. It was neither super hard nor super easy. I think we're probably entering the death throes of this section as we know it. And because of that, we're going to see variability in difficulty going forward as they pull out some probably weird stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that, that, that we would happen. If I were to do a, a crystal mini ball uh, on this, one of the things I would say is expect something unusual that might not happen in November, but it might, it might not happen in January, but it might, the likelihood seems higher. Let's go through the real logic games as we saw it. And the interesting thing was, is there were no experimental games administered. We've been saying that's what they're doing. That is consistent with getting rid of this section or changing it substantially going forward. So everybody here listening knows, hey, the games I had were real. And if you had two logic games section, you are a unique outlier <laughs> uh, that I would like to hear from. So send me a message. Let's open up where we saw some of the usage uh, from originally November 2020, and then again in April 2022. This is a section that started off with a game that really you could call the Scarborough Fair game, uh, <laughs> Parsley Sage, Rosemary Thyme, a bunch of spices, then a game about film festivals, movies, and theaters, then one about music lessons, piano and violin, and then an antique auction. And this was interesting. This was in heavy use on Friday morning. And I saw a number of people say, oh, no, they didn't predict any of the games. Yet, I actually had looked at these games beforehand and had selected close models within the recommended LG problem set. So I was really fortunate to get a few messages from people that are like, I'm glad I did those. Mm -hmm. It helped. Like the type of grouping game that I talked about specifically in the crystal ball to be able to say, you're going to see this kind of like in out heavy conditional type of scenario. That's the first game on there. Another thing that I said during the crystal ball was these conditionally sequenced rules, like A is ahead of B, then C is ahead of D. They're tough. They're mm -hmm. tricky. We know they're using them. It's very high likelihood you're going to see it. Go study them. So from a name standpoint, we don't talk about named games and, and care about it too much, but the conceptual discussion that we had was tailor-made for this section. And so that's where I think sometimes, John, you and I are like, it's gotten so focused on whether or not RC name topics showed up that I think the nuance and the real utility, which is the recommended problem sets, is being lost, especially on the game side. Yeah, I agree that with you. That section was real. Another real section 
started off, this was new use to us uh, with five tr truck drivers and a weekly schedule, then scheduling six seminars, kind of almost like a one through six and then another one through six uh, over semesters, if I recall. <clears throat> and then mm -hmm. what uh, a lot of people call a constellation game, astronomer looking at the night sky. Um, and then finally assigning people to teams that were like North, South, and West. Uh, and that third game, especially the Constellation game, as we'll call it, astronomy game, that mm -hmm. was a tough game. I'm not sure the rest of the games were all that challenging from a relative standpoint. Another real section that actually goes back to October of 2020 starts off with summer camp activities like hiking, painting, volleyball, then music auditions in concert halls at uh, 9, 10, and 11 in the morning. Then a bunch of ancient artifacts like clay tablets. And then the first of two kind of fashion games that we saw throughout the weekend. Five fashion brands to three stores. And well known as a tricky game. Uh, and there's some difficulty in this section. That's not just like a cakewalk that's in there. Let's go on to the fourth section. That started off with, I think, dancer rehearsals uh, on like days of the week. I think it was dancers, though. Uh, a composer, kind of uh, an orchestral composer doing kind of like concertos and compositions with various instruments. Then a tools on three shelves game. And then finally, this kind of like fashion brands. I think it was seven brands heading off to two stores. Third and fourth games there, both difficult. This is a challenging section. You saw a lot of people complaining about the fact that they didn't feel, I think this is the section where they didn't feel like any individual game was super tough, mm -hmm. but it was all very time consuming. And so they felt like I'm moving, I'm moving. And they get to the end and they're like, I'm out of time. We saw mention of a fifth section out there that dealt with fertilized and irrigated crops, but I'm not really sure about it. I saw some mention of games about fruits, uh, but I don't know if that's a completely different section or if somebody misremembering that's out there. Let's say for the you know the matter of it that it was real. That would be five sections of Logic Games. And we didn't see mention of that really until very late on Sunday and uh, later on Monday. So those are your, f we'll say, really four scored for sure. The fifth one, uh, really, we'll have to see what kind of reports we get afterwards. This was one of those things where I think test fatigue set in. By the time we got to Monday, everyone was just sick of it. They didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to see it on Reddit or what have you. They just wanted it to go away uh, and just get their score as quickly as possible. Something that I could completely understand and agree with at that point. Yeah, I understand it. I don't know if I agree with it because it puts us in a bind. I, I don't feel comfortable enough with that fifth section you just mentioned with the fertilized and irrigated crops to even take a stab at a scale prediction for it. And, and we won't. Yeah. And so I, I think we're going to talk about the first four in terms of how they'll move the needle potentially. But if you had that fifth section, we just didn't hear enough about it to know what to do. And we've always said with this, if we're not confident, we will not, you know, stake a claim. We're not, we're not doing this as guesswork. We're doing this to be as informed as possible, as accurate as possible. And if we can't meet that high bar we set for ourselves, we're not even going to attempt to jump. All right, John, that so leaves you to Here's handle. my disclaimer. It's, it's a fair disclaimer, and you and I both agree on this. It's like, we're not trying to guess. If we wanted yeah. to just guess, we'd be like, oh, for sure, they had that section, and that's uh, not going to have any effect. I don't know. Yeah. Here's what we do know more about, happily. Um, the uncertainties go away as we get into reading comp. There were, from what we could tell, four scored sections of reading comprehension and use, and one experimental that we saw. So I'm going to bounce through all five of those. And I'll start with the one that opened testing on Friday morning, again, from November 2020 and April 22 as a source test. So not something we would have anticipated seeing a third time, but here it is. The first passage was about um, the Harlan and African-American Renaissance and art. I think there's a reference to Spike Lee, a tricky passage to start the section, which is unfortunate. It was a passage number two about the European Union, forests, and interestingly enough, uh, the source of some fairy tales. Passage three was the comparative. It was about acoustic law, the rule of law and judicial rules. And then this section ended with a passage, on, a science passage on club cells in fish skin uh, and how that related to bird predation and avoiding it. So again, pretty standard section in terms of overall topics, a lot of humanities, some science, law and comparative, um, but the third usage of that content, which surprised us a little bit. Uh -huh. Friday afternoon, we saw a different real section come into play. At this point, they were all paired with double LR, from what I could tell. So we knew these were real straight away as the only reading comp that people were seeing. 
and it was 27 questions. This is a new section, had these four passages. The first one was about the rights of natural things like rivers and forests. The second passage was about sentimentality and literature, highbrow and lowbrow works. A lot of comments on that. Passage three was about medical simulations and how they're used to train healthcare professionals. And then this one concluded with another science passage that was comparative about water on the moon, which again, I would like to read. But those were all new, so we hadn't seen those before that we could track, but they were real if you had that section, even if it was paired with a different reading comp, that one counted. And then we got into the weekend. Nope. Say again? I was going to say, and nobody liked that sentimentality passage. You saw a lot of complaints about was, that. And I think, yeah, the one that got the most complaints. Yeah, you saw it in the first section that you talked about with like the forests and the acoustic law, uh, having a lot of comments about it. In this one, it was a lot about the sentimentality. All right, so that's two of them down that were real. Let's go to the third. Yep, two more real ones coming. Um, the third real section that we saw, and this we mostly saw on Saturday and Sunday, and I think a lot of accommodated people in particular were given this section. It was 27 questions, uh, and it was sourced back to the October 2020 test. And it had some passages we've talked about before in crystal balls. The first one started off with uh, Chinua Chibes, if I'm saying that right, things fall apart, and how it related to the Igbo language. The second passage was about EMF litigation, what happens essentially when new power lines or grids are established and who's responsible if something goes wrong. Is it the property owners or the company that installs it? The third passage was comparative uh, about good and bad uh, the privatization of public works projects. Something we saw a related thing in a game, interestingly enough. And then it concluded with a science passage that was tricky about uh, fungi spores on trees and tree endophytes. Something we've talked about, as I say, in Crystal Balls is a topic to research before. That was the third set of reading comp. And there was one more that we caught. The fourth and final real section of reading comprehension, 27 questions. This kicked in Sunday morning, from what I could tell. And this was something we predicted to the letter from February 2022. The first passage was on jazz. That's all I got. The second passage was on contract law and class action lawsuits. That was the comparative passage. It was tricky. The third passage, something we told people about in the October, November crystal ball was on socialism and communism and technocrats. And then one that Dave actually mentioned before, the fourth and final passage in this section was about zebra mussels and Lake Erie. Something I got message after message from people saying, thank you for telling me to read about zebra mussels beforehand. And technocrats. And technocrats. Yeah. So you're welcome twice. This was not as bad a section, and I don't say that just because we predicted it and people could maybe get a jump. It just didn't seem to be quite as overwhelming as some of the other things that we had seen. Finally, there was one section that we saw of experimental reading comprehension passages. These were mostly paired with the zebra mussels and the technocrats that I just mentioned. Um, maybe not exclusively, but we saw these as largely a pairing. And 27 questions, it was these four passages. There was one on Admiralty Law, UNESCO, and shipwrecks, which I should make a very clarifying point here. This is not the same passage as the UNESCO shipwreck passage on PT-93, but clearly it is pulled from the same topic. Yeah, They do, they do this with regularity. It's that they have an expert on that topic writing content for them. You saw a few people online saying, oh, I've had that passage before. That's real. And of course, during the test, we don't address whether or not things are real or not, I, just as a, a matter of fairness. So I didn't say anything, but I was like, that's wrong. Yeah. Uh, it's not the same passage. And that's something to be aware of. They use multiple topics or really one topic in multiple passages because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere out there, there's a shipwreck expert, and he has written multiple passages for LSAC, and we're seeing them continue to appear. In this case, though, they did not count. Um, so, there you go. So, that was the one set of passages in this. The other three, there was one about Mayans and rainwater and a drought. And it was a passage about street art and graffiti and advertising. And then the philosophy of the scientific method uh, was the fourth passage in this game. Maybe not fourth in order, but the fourth of the set. Might have been Thomas Kuhn in that one. Mm. But, you know, Mayans is a great example. There's another, there's an expert there who's writing a lot about Mayans. Mm -hmm. We know it. We're aware of it. It was something that we mentioned that Mayans could show up. Whether it's real or not, we were, yeah, at that point, we didn't know. But this time it turned out to be experimental. But you saw, when you saw two RC people, this was the other RC that you saw that was uh, typically paired with what they had, and that was unscored. 
So for some people I know, there was very mixed feelings about the, especially the jazz and zebra mussels versus kind of like the Mayans and the Admiralty UNESCO law. A lot of times people, I, I saw some people wanted the jazz to be real. Some people wanted the Mayans to be real. Uh, it would go back and forth, but we now know for a fact zebra mussels was real. Yeah. And honestly, that was pretty right. great. If I'm honest, and I'll just be, I'll reveal a little of my emotions with this. Seeing zebra mussels come in late in the weekend was extremely gratifying because, frankly, we want to get these predictions right as best we can. Uh, so knowing that we actually had that test, again, nailed for people. And I got so many messages saying thank you. Um, that, was a, that was a nice moment in what was an avalanche of content. <laughs> yeah. Some validation is always good. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, getting that right to me is crazy, number one, <laughs> uh, just epic. But at the same time, a lot of what we're really looking at, which is like the structure of some of these games that we were able to predict and some of the games that we directed people to do and said, hey, go do this. That to me is is a lot more of the value of understanding it, like on the logic game side. But We've talked about games. We've talked about reading comprehension. Let's turn to logical reasoning. And in this particular instance, LR is always tough. And we saw a slew of people come in with double LRs, which really is a challenge. There were three different scored sections that were thrown out there. So let us start off with a section that was not easy. Uh, that if I recall had 26 questions, but it was also from one of the tests that we predicted primarily February 2022 is the last ma major usage. Mm -hmm. And let's run through some of the questions that were on there. Obligation to be kind of grateful, uh, gratitude, paying off debt and so forth to be benefactors and what have you. An archer, maintaining a reputation when facing execution fossilized leaves on different continents, sleeping pills and placebos, a uh, percentage question about accountants that everybody hated, <laughs> orcas and whales using echo echolocation to hunt, and then really kind of like the evolution of a fist to be a weapon or a tool. And then another question about AI, this time about Shakespeare's works. And again, there are multiple questions that featured AI on this test. And there's other questions we could go through here, but like memory and children aged three to seven, pay what you want as far as selling uh, book selling, lifetime prison sentences. This was all one section, those 26 questions, a hard section. You saw a lot of people complaining about it. We've talked about it on prior podcasts. Uh, we don't think it's easy. So if you had that section and you know which one it was out of a double LR, that was real. Let's go to the next section here. That was real. Uh, and again, I think this was 25 questions uh, overall. There was some confusion among people, but we feel like this was most likely 25. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, I've given uh, up on question counts, by the way. There's I just know you have. Too much confusion. I don't even, when people talk about question counts, I ignore it. Let's talk about topics. I I think in some cases, people had uh, 25 and 26 together, and it's easy to get confused. Either way, uh, this question, I think, might have started with a question about winemaking and, you know, kind of triggered your choice of drink tonight. Cheers. Uh, back yeah, in like yeah, years ago, wine jugs. And then a question that everybody was using is kind of like the touchstone to figure out. And there were a lot of questions early on. A question about koalas mm. and hugging trees to stay cool, how cute they are. Uh, this is real. That koala section is real. A few people had figured it out, but for those of you who hadn't, it is in fact something that we can confirm. Uh, further questions in there dealt with things like cosmetology services, school dress codes. I think this is the section that has like the land animal, sea animal size, yeah. uh, insect repellent ingredients, uh, small steel mills floating around. Uh, blood donations in Great Britain, all of those in the same section, that was real. So if you remember which section it was for you, and remember, you can't just say, oh, that was my first LR, everybody had it. Some people had it as their second LR, some people had it as section three, some people had it as section one, but that was scored. The last of the real sections that we definitively identified was largely seen with accommodated test takers. Uh, and this is one where there's uh, topics that include Asian vipers and venom, uh, the definition of a database, dark feathered bird bones and Neanderthals, uh, old people with shin splints and jogging, 
books and binding. Notice there are multiple questions about books and so forth, so make sure you're hearing the right one. Taxation of income and wealth and a Greek Athenian prince. So that was also a scored section, which means, for example, like a lot of times people that were trying to ask about questions about like wood stoves and the SUV hatchbacks, that section was experimental. So John said before, and I agree with this, we don't want to go through all the experimental topics because it gets really messy and then it's almost more confusing. But if you knew that, hey, I had koalas in section one and wood stoves in section three, you know that your personal section one was real and your section three was experimental. And that, John, brings us to the end of the content that we saw. Yeah. At least we found, and there was a lot. And we want to hear from you. Listen, if if there's something that you got and it doesn't match what we've said or is possibly even in disagreement with what we've said, please don't be shy. Let us know. Um, It's too little too late for this recording, but it's still going to be useful going down the road because we will see this content again and it'll be helpful for us. So, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out to us even after this. Yeah, and I think probably you and I individually spent about 60 hours each uh, over the prior four days going through this all day long. I did, yeah, some like cocktail napkin math here. And you took a lot of the early mornings. And in my typical vampire ways, I took a lot of the late nights. I don't think I went to bed before 4 a.m. any of the nights of this test. And I've got the Reddit no. comment history to prove it. Uh, and you, yeah, were up, like you were up six. early six, seven o'clock. So, I mean, we were doing like 22-hour days together. Yeah coverage Mm -hmm. yeah i would get up at like six and i'd see your notes and they'd be at like 4 15 in the morning i'm like go to bed dude uh so that's part of our concern here is there was just so much content to kind of sift through that if there is anything that got missed it's just a matter of volume not caring we definitely care yeah all right let's get to the scaling matrix of course it's going to take forever because there's so many darn sections floating around but i'm only going to focus on the real sections i'm not going to talk about the experimental sections and let's run through this one more time especially for those people who fast forwarded to this particular point <laughs> so the way we look at it is we say how many questions can you miss to get a 170 We start that as an average of you can miss seven questions, and then we find your real section of games, reading comp and LR, and we tell you in our estimation whether or not we'll have no effect, keep it as no movement, whether it will loosen it, whether it might conceivably tighten it. And then you can add each one of your individual sections onto that seven and figure out what we think your estimate is of your scaling. Keep in mind, we are always conservative. If we're not sure, we will go more conservative because that leads to happiness at the end of this process, as opposed to kind of creating a false dream that might lead to unexpected unhappiness, which we don't want to have. So just something to kind of think about as we talk about this. So let's go through these logic games. Start off with the Spices Film Festival music lessons and antique auction that we saw early on. Uh, We're going to say this does not move the scale. Keeps you at minus seven. Let's go to the truck drivers, seminars, kind of like the astronomy constellation game, uh, and then the north-south-west teams. I know that the constellation game was challenging, but we think that the other three games balance it out. Also, zero Let's go to the next one, which is the summer camp, concert halls, clay tablets, fashion brands, three stores. We've talked about this section before, John, and what we did was we really kind of landed on like a 0.5 analysis saying we don't think it changes the scale at 170. We do think that it loosens things up as you go down towards the 160s. If I had to probably make a bet today in LSAT Vegas, I would probably say it does move it, but at the same time... Um, if we were to go by historical trend, now that I've seen a little bit more about some of the content in there, I could probably feel strong, more strongly about it moving the scale by one, but we'll keep it at 0.5 because that's the more conservative estimate here. Yeah, I'm good with that. But if you're like, if you're thinking in the middle, no, that was super hard. I'm kind of agreeing with you. All right. Let's go to that next section, which was the dance rehearsals, dancers, the orchestral instruments, the concertos, tools on three shelves, and then fashion brands to two stores. This, historically, we have said is a very difficult section, and we feel very strongly this moves the scale by one. So essentially, everyone's either at seven, seven and a half to eight, or eight itself. If there was a fifth section about fertilized and irrigated crops, you're going to have to use your best estimate, because we don't know. (laughs) 
All right, so now you can already start to see some people sitting there at seven, some at eight, some thinking they might be even in the middle. Let's go to reading comprehension because that will now make some changes as well. Start with the Harlem arts, the forests and fairy tales, the acoustic law passages, the club cells and fish skin. We talked about this on prior podcast years ago. This moves the scale by one. Mm -hmm. So if you were at seven, you went to eight. If you're at eight, you went to nine. Uh, next passage set, the rights of natural things, uh, sentimentality passage, uh, the medical simulations and the moon water. I'm not sure John and I have 100% agreement. We're going to say this one is moving it by one as well, L largely on the force of the sentimentality passage. Yeah, I won't fight you on that. And then uh, a passage we saw for a lot of accommodated test takers, uh, Chinua Chebe, uh, EMF litigation, privatizing private works, fungi spores on trees. We've talked about this one on past tests. Uh, it was on the October 2020 LSAT. This moves the scale by one. So you can see the lineup of hard RC is uh, kind of like maintaining itself uh, historically. Yeah. That does not continue, though, with the jazz <laughs> passage. This is jazz, contract law, social communism, technocrats, zebra muscles. Uh, bad news for you folks. We're leaving that one at zero and having no effect. So again, lots of zeros and ones moving around, some 0.5s floating around. This gives us to the LR. Let's start with that first section we talked about, about the arch, the archer, the uh, orcas and whales echolocation, the fists, the Shakespeare AI. I think the leaves is in there as well. That is a tough section. That moves it by one. So you can see that there's a conceivable, if you got the right We'll call it the right, but that's really in quotations because I don't think it's the right lineup. It's the wrong lineup for anybody. That would move the scale to 10. I'm not sure off the top of my head if anybody had that lineup, but if you did, I feel bad for you because they just kept punching you in the face, but yeah. now they give you a scale break at the end. And that's about as loose a scale as I think we've ever estimated here, man. Minus nine has happened a couple of times on release tests. We haven't seen a, a minus 10 actually come out. I think it's possible we see a test get released next month, but that's a separate conversation. But so far, minus nines is loose as we've gotten. Minus 10 would be pretty unusual, but this was an unusual trifecta. I'd have to go back in and take a look at, you know, kind of like the individual test lineups. I think a lot of these people had one of the first two games that wasn't like super brutal. So I think this combination is very unlikely that somebody has minus 10. I think probably most of the people are minus nine. Yeah. But it is possible because there, I mean, there's 20,000 plus people who took this test. There are variations out there that are unusual. Let's continue on in LR. Let's go to the, the wine making, wine jugs, the koalas hugging trees, uh, blood donations, insect repellent, and so forth. That is not going to move the scale. That would be a zero if you had that section. Just doesn't move it one way or the other. And then finally, Neanderthal, shin splints, viper venom, book bindings also a zero as we've talked about in the past. So only one of the three LR sections has an impact, but those of you who had that LR section know that it does have an impact. It was not an easy section. Uh, and so the way to use that is to go through each one, hear your logic games, make the adjustment from seven, hear your RC, make the adjustment from what you did with LG, and then hear your LR and make the adjustment, if any, to what you have from LG and RC together. And that should give you a rough estimate of what we think the scaling looks like to get a 170. Obviously, the harder the content, the looser the scale should be. The easier the content, the tighter the scale should be. And so... That brings us to the end of a very long discussion. <laughs> we'll all find out the truth, at least in terms of individual scores, on Wednesday. And this time I'll get it right, John. Nope. November 1st. Nailed it. <laughs> at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Nice. That. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how these scores shake out. Um, uh, again, we, we won't know unless some of this becomes publicly available, but... I feel pretty good about these predictions. What I don't love about these score estimates is just how many different outcomes feel possible here. Anywhere from seven to 10, potentially minus seven to 10 in half point increments. Mm -hmm. So it's got, yeah, that's a lot. It's got a very wild West feel to it. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot going on, a lot of different directions. You could see the confusion in the discussions online that people were having where they're trying to figure things out. And it's just frustrating. We feel for you. It's honestly why we do this. 
uh, is to try to like alleviate some of the anxiety that people are going to feel. It's the same reason we do the crystal ball is to try to make people feel a little bit better about, look, normalcy is kind of like the default. Uh, and this is what you should do if you're worried about strange things happening on the test. So, John, any final comments on a really lengthy October LSAT and a lengthy podcast recapping it and the fear that this will happen all over again in November? We take those separately. One, it feels really good to be at the finish line of anything, especially a race this long. So, yeah, uh, October in the bag, aside from next week's makeup. Um, nice to, to put a pen in that. We'll see what happens in November. I can tell you right now, November's got 30 plus thousand people registered for it. So, if there was any hope from either of us that November was going to be a lighter lift, I think we can dispel with it. It's uh, it's going to be another gauntlet. Yeah, and if we can slip in a podcast and add any additional information, we'll do that. Um, it's going to be tough. I've got to do a little bit of traveling. You've got some stuff coming up. So, it might not be something we can get to immediately, and that's part of our yeah, it's what's causing us not to be able to do that mini ball. It's just the tight timeline in terms of everything. So, but John, on that note, I have nothing else to say. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may have found it. And if you've enjoyed it, leave us a comment or a rating as well. We're definitely going to be doing an admissions mailbag uh, episode sometime soon. So you can send us admissions questions uh, about the law school process to LSAT podcast at powerscore.com. Once again, on behalf of John and myself, we hope you've enjoyed it. Please don't summarize this online. Stay safe out there. We hope you did well on this test and you found this useful, and we will talk to you soon.